The one quote that stood out to me was from Catherine Buvac, uh, the president of Nokia Enterprise, when she said that 5G will enable industrial revolution. It's not the first time we've had an industrial revolution, is it, Gunn? What's different no. this time for the workforce? Well, first of, all, first of all, I think the fact that the workforce is being transformed by technology, as you say, it's not new. I mean, it actually goes back to spinning Jenny 250 years ago. And in as many years, it has caused fear, anxiety, and worry about workers, about their jobs. And what, what we have seen is really that this has brought prosper prosperity to businesses, to societies, to people. And, and the question, I believe, is discussed now in all executive rooms and all boardrooms is with the introduction of artificial intelligence, of machine learning, robotization, will it be the same? Will it be to mutual benefit or is it different this time? And I, I think the answer to that is uh, probably both. It will be both a challenge and a threat, and it can be an opportunity. And if, if you do this right, I think it will be beneficial for most, if not all. If one fails, I think it will kill businesses if they do not address these issues. So of course, then the big question is, how do you do this right? And in my mind, this is much more about people and culture than it is about the machines. I, um, I, I think in our business, the people will still be at the core of the business. We will have uh, machines, making sure that there are less repetitive tasks, freeing up more time for customers, and to be creative. And this collaboration between humans and machine, I think, will be key going forward. So, so to really understand what are the capabilities of the humans and machine, mm -hmm. and when can you use that, to br what does that bring to the different type of works, and the tasks will be critical. So it will be about people, it will be about competence, skill, organizational structure, innovation, culture. Mm -hmm. To that point, Sook Kung, how are you fostering a culture of innovation and excitement in the workforce about the next stage of digitalization? Well, the pace of change has certainly accelerated. Mm. And I think what is critical, obviously, is to make sure that we have a workforce that is ready. So you, you, there is a fair amount of manpower planning that's necessary with the kind of pace of change you're going to see, the kind of, uh, you know, you, you, you've got to work on two, uh, two prongs concurrently. You will be hiring a lot of digital talent because this is what the new businesses will require. And at the same time, you would need to rescale your existing workforce. And that's something that we do, that, that you've got to consciously plan for. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, that will be a key prong to, uh, you know, handling the, uh, the challenges in the, in the highly, you know, in the digital world that's moving so quickly. Nicholas, when we talk about technology unlocking new ways of working, augmenting the workforce, these are phrases that come up a lot, uh, but I feel sometimes they're not actually explained. So can you give us some real examples of this? Yeah, so I mean, uh, we're all in the tech business, most of us. So of course, we, we like dwelling into technologies and the potential of technologies. You mentioned artificial intelligence, there's machine learning, there's robotics. And we're, of course, all pushing the envelope on how we can leverage that in our businesses. And uh, uh, obvious examples are, for instance, in, in our line of business where you basically use a lot of analytics, big data, to improve the decision making, the quality of your decision making. So that's, of course, of interest for leadership to make sure we have more robust decision making. That's, you could argue, basic. <laughs> uh, if we take it to the field and the kind of things we're experimenting with right now, uh, augmented reality in our factories. We are doing uh, pilot activities where uh, testers, for instance, will be able to overlay information on the board and procedures as they're troubleshooting boards. So already now we're running first pilots on how we can use yeah. augmented reality to improve the worker's ability to troubleshoot in a more effective way and to learn across uh, different assembly lines. So of course these technologies are making it into our workforce as well. And I mean, yeah. building on sort of the fourth industrial revolution mm -hmm. and all the paranoia we've had mm -hmm. around sort of 
robots taking over, a singularity. I think what's different in this fourth industrial revolution is the depth and the breadth. It's, 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 it's more complicated. Mm. And uh, that was the point you were making, right? So I think the, the big challenge for us, and I don't see it so much with our employees, sort of the, the anxiety or the paranoia around this, mm. but as managers, we're probably not so well equipped, and I think you made the point as well, on how do we train and rescale our workforce to deal with that. I mean, we actually brought in, uh, we collaborate with the University of Berkeley. We brought mm. in Professor Goldberg that has done some interesting work on a different way to think about it. He, he talks about multiplicity, which is really how do you work together with AI, robotics, and humans, to your point, because we still have a lot of value to add in the equation. And it's a, of course, it's a more positive way to think about it, but I also think it's highly relevant. and. It also brings out the point of the, the relevance, again, of reskilling, constant learning, and diversity in the workforce. So we're doing a lot of work right now in North America to make sure yeah. that by having a more diverse workforce, we can actually then leverage uh, artificial intelligence and robotics in a different way. Good. I know you want to talk about diversity and inclusion, but you wanted to respond to something yeah. Nicholas was saying. Because I, I think you are very right in the way that some skills will be in higher demand. Mm. Yeah. Basic digital skills, programming. Yeah but also more cognitive skills yeah. like creativity. Yeah. The challenge uh, is that these are the skills that all companies across business are looking for. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, if you, if you say that you would only hire and buy that kind of competence, it will probably not be possible right. and it will be extremely costly. Right. So there is no other choice than to do reskilling and upskilling yeah. of your own workforce. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, which of course means that if I take this from the the, the boardroom, I'm not an right. executive uh, telecom, I'm non-executive uh, chair. It is people <laughs> strategy is actually moving up mm. the rank mm. in the importance when you have strategic discussions in the boardroom. So this is at the key right. of the, the business. Mm. How do you do this in practice? And yes. for example, in, in Telenor, what we have done is to introduce a program with 40 hours of learning for all employees, mm. all 25,000 employees are expected to spend 40 hours, mm. of which 50%, 20 hours, should be digital. Mm. Mm. So an online campus where employees can then choose courses, of course they should be relevant, but there are different courses you can choose. And I think the very positive element, this was the first year we had it, is that on average, 47 hours mm. spent, yeah. actually mm. more Unexpected. So mm. it means that this, you can, you can ask, is this driven by fear? Is that why they have this enthusiasm? Or is it because people want to learn? And I believe the latter. Mm. Yes. I believe, I believe people are quite motivated to keep themselves updated. Well, yeah, we'll come back to the point um, of, of people wanting to learn because it, it, it's actually mm. interesting, the workforce versus some, some of the management on that point. A uh, good report by Accenture, which I'll refer to in a moment. But I just wanted to bring you in, um, Suk Kung, on the subject of uh, the fight for talent, not yeah, just sure. within the telco industry, but the fact that you're fighting with all other industries, as Gun was pointing to. Yeah. How at Singtel do you ensure, and I know you're also reskilling your current workforce, but yeah. how do you ensure that you attract new talent in such a competitive environment? Well, I think the competition of, for talent is just not amongst telcos. Yes. You're competing for the same t group, same type of talent with the global tech players, the Googles, the Facebook of this world. You're also competing for talent against what is very well-funded startups. So, you know, clearly uh, well, we would have to make sure that uh, we have packages that would, would be competitive, that would be attractive. I think what's also important is the nature of the work and you know, the, the, if, they, if they think that you offer them a career where they have an opportunity to learn, to contribute meaningfully, it makes a difference. One of the things that we have also done is that in a number of the digital startups that we have formed, uh, you know, the long-term incentives that we give to the staff actually direct is, uh, re relates directly to the performance of the digital investment and not you know, the Singtel LTI because if, you know, the line of sight for someone working, say, in our digital marketing company to Singtel's performance is so distant, so remote, that it would be very difficult to motivate them. So what we have done is we have created 
uh, you know, option plans that relates directly to their performance. So making sure that you have create the right kind of incentives is also very important. Mm -hmm. And what about the right... And of course, I should also add that, uh, you know, some of the skills are really in hot demand. You know, something like the data scientist, you never get enough data scientists. We, we all have that challenge. Uh, we've started up the cybersecurity business, trying to build up the pool of cyber, you know, security professionals. It's a real challenge. So what we have done is we've worked very closely with the uh, universities. We actually set up programs that, you know, the curriculum is planned by us. We provide a significant number of scholarships so that, you know, we train them ground up. We have also done you know, professional conversion programs. So people who have some IT training, you know, after, you know, we put them through a, a, the, the kind of training program, they get certified and they become a, a cybersecurity personnel. So, so those are some of the things that we do to try to add to the talent pool. Mm -hmm. uh, Gun, can you draw the line for me between what we're talking about and the importance of diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. in this move forward? I think this is very important. For example, if you take a lot of the telecom companies are uh, large companies, it's incumbents, been in business for a long time, meaning that we have also an aging uh, population or aging workforce. And of course, if you don't put your efforts into also upskilling mm -hmm. of, that, uh, you, of that workforce, you lose out on a pool and resources for creativity and for increased efficiency. So I think when you talk about inclusion, to, to think about upskilling, it doesn't stop at 55, I think was mentioned earlier today. I mean, if we all live till we are into the hundreds, you can't stop working at 60, can you? <laughs> so of course, you need to, to make sure that you, you make yourself relevant. And I, I th actually think from uh, being attractive as an employer, I think this employer branding and thinking about that is really key because the, the, the millennials, but also the ones uh, slightly older than that, they will know that they will have a responsibility on their own to keep themselves relevant. So what kind of employer do you look for? Yeah. You want to, to, people ask in a recruitment process, what kind of um, learning programs do you have? What kind of possibilities will I have to re-career and build my own career within the system. And so that's one element of it. I think the other one is in a world of change, as you were alluding to, how do you make the business alert and agile to the changes? How do you make sure that you are uh, alert to changes in customer behavior and preferences? I think the answer to that means that you need a diverse workforce. Mm. You need to have diversity of mind and brain. And in my mind, I'm not talking about diversity and gender now. I'm talking mm. about diversity in the broad of context. Yeah. Of, yes, diversity of mind. Mm. It's of course gender. I think it's important. And we should have programs working with that. It's about ethnicity. It's about age. It's even about disabilities. It's all kind of diversity. And to make sure that you, in that way, have the best <laughs> workforce. I mean, to me, it's almost self-explanatory. You want to tap into the competence pool of the whole population, not only part of it. Nicholas? Yeah, I love to build on that. It's, mm. I, I, I agree with you there. I mean, I think it's so important. And we're not, in, I mean, if I speak for my part of the industry, we're not really very diverse. This is not what your average <laughs> leadership team totally looks like, not right? Representative. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> if we then take a leadership team that is homogeneous and we add artificial intelligence to it, we're going to go really, really wrong. <laughs> and there is good examples or maybe bad good examples uh, in the industry where one of uh, the WebScare companies basically built a recruitment application and it was a pr apparently a pretty homogeneous team that put the <laughs> algorithms together. So they were wondering why they kept recruiting this exactly the same type of people, right? So I guess it's a simple example just to emphasize the point that if we don't get diversity inclusion right first, then we will not be able to leverage the, the benefits of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and, and robotics in a good way. So it's, it's fundamental to get that right first. You know, I, yeah. I don't think we need to harp on that. I mean, it's just so obvious. I mean, if you don't have, and again, it goes back to uh, Goldberg's thought on this idea of multiplicity. 
it's by having diversity of thought that we can really find a much better collaboration between man and machine that should be of benefit for. Uh, I just wanted to, sorry, I just wanted to jump in because um, at workers, employees might often feel a fear that they're going to have to fight for their jobs with this digitalization. But from what you're saying, is just as much a fight for employers for oh, talent. Yeah. So is this actually, rather than being um, an employer's market, it's an employee's market, or at the very least, equal between the two? If, if I can yes. jump in on that, I think it's actually both. What mm. I mm. fear is that you will see a polarization because you will have a part of the workforce who have, who have the attractive skills, who have the right mindset, and are willing and capable of keeping themselves updated. They will be in high demand, mm -hmm. and it will actually be a fight for talent, and I think that it will be employee market. Mm. And then you have, unfortunately, a part which will, uh, either because they don't have the capability or they don't have the willingness, I actually saw I saw a research, I think it was done by Accenture, saying that of the total population they had interviewed, 25% had low willingness to change. Mm. And of course, if you have low willingness mm. to, to change, uh, then you will not be in the group which is fought for. Mm. It's, it will not be attractive. So the polarization is what I... Yes. Would describe. Right. That's a great moment to bring up this research. Uh, I do prep my panels. I sent them the research ahead of time. Mm -hmm. It's a piece of research yeah. by Accenture uh, called the Future Telco Workforce. And actually, um, the bit that I found interesting, I mean, you know, it was right at the beginning. I did read past the intro, though, I assure you, <laughs> um, is that workers are receptive to and excited about coming changes with 63% believing that AI will have a positive impact on their work. I found that surprising, first of all, because that's not generally the impression you get in the media, naughty media, mm -hmm. but only 21% of CSP leaders surveyed highlighted advanced workforce planning for future skills needs mm. as a top initiative. So actually, in this report, uh, they talk about bridging a digital disconnect where workers are actually excited, believe AI will have a positive impact, but the leaders are not doing necessarily the sufficient workforce mm. planning. Can I just get your initial reaction to that as a leader and a CEO of yeah. a company? Uh, so uh, that, that was what I was mentioning mm. earlier, that clearly, you know, with, with AI, uh, with all the machine learning coming through, we, you, we, you know, we would use a lot of that in our workplace. And you know, as a result, there are some jobs that will definitely become redundant with, with, with productivity you know, that we, we expect to see. Jobs will be, become redundant. And therefore, you know, a very uh, you know, conscientious and careful planning as to the pace and rate of change will be necessary so that you, you would know how to handle the workforce that may become displaced and the kind of training that is necessary to minimize that. Because in the end, if the person is willing to be trained, then that, you, know, you, can, you can help them transition to a new career. But for the workers who are unwilling or unable to be trained, then you would have to help them plan for their outplacement. Mm. I mean, you seem to have done a lot of work around this at Singtel. Do you feel that in the industry or in your region, you're actually out ahead with the amount of work you've done? Or in speaking to other executives, are they making similar preparations? Well, I think what we have done is that in, we have, we, you know, the strategy that we deployed in Singtel is that we're very focused on digitalizing our core. So, you know, that, and, so and in addition, we're also making new investments in you know in digital in the digital area, I talked about cybersecurity. We're also into digital marketing. Uh, we're also into data analytics, regional video. So these new investments also create new job opportunities. And there is a, they you know with the retraining that we provide in the people who are traditionally in our core business. There's, there are also opportunities in the new businesses that that we build. Um, I, I I think. Um, the rate at which different companies respond, it's also a function of how quickly they have been able to adjust their business models. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I, I think you know, we, we, we realize and we learned this lesson very early that if your lunch is going to be eaten, better eat your own lunch. <laughs> so, we've been, so we've been planning for that quite consciously. And you know, uh, some of the other telcos where their core business may erode at a slower pace, 
may feel less pressing need to transform their workforce. Yeah. Nicholas, you're nodding along. You know, I agree. I mean, I think, uh, you know, build on the, there is another polarization here, and you both touched upon it. I mean, and that's the fact that, I mean, at, at the more creative or leadership type roles, you can see an easy augmentation by these technologies to, again, enable better decision making. Uh, and then you have uh, at the, uh, and so you will see benefits of that there. And then you will see a high intensity probably in ma intense manual labor, uh, which you still need. So there is also pressure in the middle of the stack, if I may say so, where you may see a bigger risk of actually jobs being displaced. Now, I don't remember, I think McKinsey had an interesting study. It's probably dated now, two years ago. I haven't seen the follow-up. The follow but the suggestion was that there is actually not a whole lot of jobs that get displaced entirely by these technologies, but there is tasks within jobs mm -hmm. that may see a higher degree of displacement. Uh, so I, I think that's also an interesting thought. And again, I think it's really, I don't see the anxiety in our workforce in general, but I think we have to do a better job as leaders to prepare our workforce. And we've touched on several of the, the key tools to do that. I mean, continuous learning, mm -hmm. you need to create the stimuli. You mean you talked about incentive programs. I mean, we need to make it easy and interesting and relevant for our workforce to prepare how mm -hmm. to leverage these new technologies to enhance the jobs. Mm -hmm. To your point about a certain parts of, of roles being challenged, Gun, I know we talked about this uh, before the panel, but I'm wondering how you see the evolution um, continuing from roles-based work towards project-based yes. work. I was actually thinking about that when Nicholas mm. was speaking now, that this is also something that has to do with organizational structure. Mm. Because if you look at the old way of having an organization based on, on hierarchical models, they are not the future model for organization. Mm. I, I mean, decisions have to be made, not the old model where you brought it up layer by layer, mm. but you have to make sure that its, it's uh, decisions are made at the level where you have the right information, mm -hmm. which is lower down in the organization. So how do you work with this? And I think here, startups have a big advantage because mm -hmm. they don't have the challenge of existing businesses. So what I see in, in my experience is that you need to have a model or you need to find um, a way of having the old structures living together with the new structures. Some of the existing companies have solved this by having the new on the side, which of course may be quicker, but it slows down the speed of change in the rest of the organization. So you need to find a way to get this together. And the project-based organization and team-based organizations will be a, a, an answer to, to this. But of course, this is complicated, especially, or it's at least increasing complexity for the leadership levels going forward, yeah. which I guess is yeah. what you are alluding mm -hmm. to. Yeah. yeah, and to that point as well, are we going to see the rise of more of a non-permanent workforce across yes. a lot of these Definitely. business models? I don't know if you all uh, agree with that. Yeah. Or, yeah. And, yeah. and that causes some challenges because mm -hmm. that non-permanent workforce might not be as connected to the business. And if you I mean, we have touched upon the reputation being important. Mm -hmm. And you had an example mm. of, uh, of the bias in mm. the recruitment process. I mean, if you think about the Cambridge Analytica, mm. where you're not lost trust only by <laughs> customers, but also by future employees. If you mm. see yourself fighting for talent, you will have to focus even more on reputation. So how do you deal with that in this perspective? How would you deal with that, Sukum? Well, I, I think, you know, even as it, when we do customer-facing roles, yeah. whether the person is a contract staff or permanent staff, we would apply the same standards in, in the recruitment process, okay? Mm. I, I mean, the uh, contract staff gives you a lot more flexibility in manpower planning, but, you know, whether they are contract or permanent employee, they still represent a company. Mm. And so you must apply the same standards, you know, in your selection in the, in the rigor, in the test that you would subject the, the candidate to. So I, I think, you know, there is no excuse, uh, an excuse that this is a contract staff, this is the non-permanent staff. So if, if they act in a way that's inconsistent with our values, nobody would accept that. So, so, so we are very conscious that while contract staff gives us a lot of flexibility 
in manpower planning and also allowed us to bring in specialized skills if needed for a shorter period of time. You know, the, the recruitment and selection process must be just as rigorous. Mm. We've talked a lot um, about AI specifically. I'm wondering, Nicholas, how 5G will affect oh, finally, the future workplace. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We've finally got to your talking Five point. Five minutes left. <laughs> So if you think about digital transformation, yeah. which is what we've been talking about, and leveraging digital capabilities, the way I think about it um, is that the next step on that journey, and we see that in, again, the Industry 4.0 revolution, evolution, is to do it wireless, right? So you add wireless capabilities to that, and then if you think about some of these digital capabilities, like AI, voice recognition, when I'm in Silicon Valley and we talk to developers about these technologies and new capabilities, uh, they get really excited about, in particular, the latency and how responsive that uh, industrial internet could be with these type of capabilities. So they're clearly already thinking about the next man-machine interface, not just voice recognition, but what can you do if you have the wireless capabilities? So you can take digital plus wireless and think about the capabilities in terms of transformation there. And I mean, obvious examples, and we, we're doing some work with, for instance, a mining operator. It's a high-risk job. Uh, you're operating uh, heavy equipment in mines underground, and you're using explosives uh, from time to time. And then every time you have basically used explosives, you evacuate the mine, you run heavy air conditioning to clear the mine for workers to go back in. So it's it's both dangerous, it's in, not sustainable because you're running, I think in the case of Sweden, we run 2% of our nuclear power bill is air conditioning in mines. If you can do that with a remote workforce sitting outside the mine or in a remote location where the remote uh, sensory, uh, you can run the diggers, remote <coughs> control, haptic feedback, you will have a, a, a real experience like you're sitting in the digger in the mine. So it's safer, mm. uh, it's more efficient, you can operate around the clock and it's more sustainable. So I think there is a ton of use cases and that's what we focus on at the show. We try to bring some of this technology to life. I think the combination of digital transformation and wireless 5G technology mm. has uh, enormous potential. And which part, uh, Nicholas, of the 5G value chain do you see impacted most in terms of the workforce? 5G value chain, sorry, I'm drawing a blank there. So, it's um, been a long for, day. so for example, uh, would it be uh, the telcos? Would oh, it okay, be okay. the network uh, equipment yeah, providers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the biggest challenge we have as an industry, working between <laughs> end customers. If we say Gun represents a bank, you represent the service provider, I represent the supplier mm. into this value chain. I think the big question is not, is there big value in industry transformation? We've done multiple research with different firms I mean, there's hundreds of billions of dollars globally in industry transformation. Industries will transform with or without us, mm -hmm. like it or not. Uh, my hope, our hope, of course, is that we can address this profit pool by equipping our customers to do a better job in supporting industry transformation. And that, of course, should spill over for us as well. I mean, the industries will need our technologies to transform. Our customers are best equipped to build those networking capabilities for industries. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm hoping that we can find a, a good opportunity to shift our industry into a new profit pool, see some growth on the customer side, which should be good for us as well. Yeah. I want to highlight um, another quote from, again, another panelist uh, earlier, Rima Qureshi, Orange's EVP and Chief Strategy Officer, where she said that the line in the sand for what humans can do and what technology can do keeps shifting. Mm -hmm. Now, if the line in the sand keeps shifting, and I don't know if you agree with that or not, mm -hmm. It makes planning as a leader for your workforce quite difficult. So how would you handle that if you mm -hmm. agree with that, first of all, Gun? Well, uh, you need to plan, but of, of course you need to, to do the, the workforce planning. I think that is a, a key, and I'm worried about the 21% that you said in, your, mm. in, the, in the survey that only 21% of leaders do that. Mm. Uh, that was a shocking low number, but again, it's, it's not given. So this is why you need to have this diversity to make sure that you are alert and agile to trends and what, what is happening out there because nobody really knows. I mean, just think back three years. What did we know about cloud and the possibilities for cloud and look where we are today. So where will we be in three years? We need not think about now. But that is, in my mind, not an excuse for not planning. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. It's okay. Well, I think AI has been much feared hmm. that it, it, would take, it may take over the world, which is why I suppose, you know, people are talking about setting ethical standards. But I, I think in the end, I believed in human power. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, uh, while with, with, with AI and with all the analytics, you know, uh, working should be more efficient. But I think in the end, you know, the human being, the human brain is still at the center of it all. Next yeah, I'll be brief. I'll build on what, what you guys said. I mean, I think this idea of multiplicity, again, I mean, adding uh, the human factor paired up with AI machine learning, I in my mind, is the uh, secret to make it happen. And then if you think of lean, agile ways of working, so I mean, uh, again, there's two dimensions on the workforce side. One is that we make sure that we're more flexible. So if the line in the sand is moving, which I happen to agree with, then we need to adopt. I mean, it's going to be continuous learning. We're going to test and push the boundaries. We're going to maybe find out that that didn't work, go back and yeah. try another path. So I think we, as, as organizations and leaders of large organizations, we need to build that into our DNA. It's a more, you can't rely on firm structures. I think we need to find a more um, mm -hmm. lean, agile way of addressing and working with challenges on the one hand side. And then I think it was part of the Accenture report. And we will be borrowing external workforce because uh, we mm -hmm. understand that there is a workforce out there that wants to be working for five employers a week. So how do you make that work? Mm -hmm. And that's also requiring yeah. a different uh, way to organize ourselves. Mm -hmm. But very short, we need to make sure that we don't bring new biases into mm -hmm. our organizations. <laughs> I mean, we have talked a lot about unconscious biases. Yeah. And the example that you yeah. Yeah. used uh, earlier, Niklas, is being by having a bias in the logarithm itself. Yeah. So I mean, there are exactly. obviously risks here mm. we need. And that's why I think we need the humans to make sure that we exactly. control those risks. Yes, and I'm taking away that really all businesses should be focusing just as much on their workforce as on returns on investment or revenues or profitability. Okay, thank you. All three of you, thank you so much.